should not be that bad. They not ready. <laughs> Welcome to Real Talk Radio. The show that says just because you don't attend with them does not mean that you're not in him. The him being Jesus. The show that plants seeds and water seeds, but God gives the increase. Let's talk about it on Real Talk Radio. This show is a continuation of the church folk revolution. Enjoy the show. I don't believe they are. Are you ready? Are you yeah, ready? I'm ready. You ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. I'm telling you this. <laughs> before we even, before we even dive in, this is the show today. One of those shows that your mama and them who are sitting up in church right now are going to be like, you listen to that. You better be giving God his money. Don't he deserve his dough? You done got that new job. This is this is one of those shows, man, that just makes, I'm not even going to say church folk, but the religious folk lose their dog on mine because so many different conclusions is leapt to just with the mention of tithing. Mm-hmm. We already know what people are going to say. Oh, you don't believe in giving? Yep. That's the first thing to come in. The very first thing. You know what? Before we even begin our commentary, let me, let me. Jonathan, you here? Or are you eating waffles yeah, man. and neck bones? Nah. Eating the nah. cat. Just... No. Chitlin tacos. <laughs> <laughs> that was nasty. That was nasty. Let me, let me pray for the anointing on your throat real quick. <laughs> Black bread pita. Black bread pita. <laughs> oh, man. Jesus, take the will. <laughs> All right, let me pray. Father in heaven, we, we love you and we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to come before you and to be able to discuss these type of topics, Lord. We thank you for the freedom that we find in your son uh, who has just been so awesome and wonderful to us. Lord, allow us to plant water some seeds today. Lord, we just ask you sincerely that you would just remove the scales from people's eyes and allow them to see truth today. Not to take our word for it, but, Father, to call on you and allow you to be that very truth. Again, we thank you for this platform. We thank you for all the listeners. We thank you for using us in the manner that you see fit. We love you and we appreciate you. And we pray all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. All right, now, slow. What's the day? Today be July the 14th, 2013. This will be the Lord's Day. The day the Lord has made. Yeah, he, he made yesterday too, by the way. This he is uh, Sunday, July the 14th in the year of our Lord of 2013. You forgot that in the year of our Lord. I'm sorry, bro. I've been out for a little bit. Yeah, don't, don't mess with me. Anyway, so what's what's on the agenda for today, fellas? The oldie or goodie? Something that really never goes away. Um, honestly, I'm really, I'm not going to say tired of talking about it because everybody hasn't heard all the other shows. But I think it does need to be talked about from time to time because people just don't. Uh, really get it. They don't understand. Uh, some people just never had even heard um, about tithing. They only know what they've been taught. They don't know the truth about tithing, I should say. Um, because as for me, and I can pretty sh- much speak for you guys as well, um, we never really, well, I guess you guys really did, but we never really studied and questioned and researched the topic of tithing um, because we all had our preconceived notions that it was you know, legitimate, and it was what it was. So I believe there are a lot of other people out here who still have the same concerns, uh, who never heard any other view on tithing. And then there's some people who are, like, right there on the fence who kind of understand a little bit, but they may just need a little more educating on the topic. So I I think it's important for us to continue to go on 
and do shows like this because, like I said, everybody hasn't heard the other shows, so I think it's important. Mm-hmm. And that's the big thing, too, man, is this this topic is going to be redundant for some. There's going to be new information, like Jonathan said, for some people. Because some people, when we did the shows before, may have been, you know, faithful tithers. But now something that God has done in their life, they're beginning to question whether or not the legitimacy of the tithing doctrine. So we just want to come through again, man, and, and, and deal with this topic from a biblical manner because what we're going to do is we're going to allow Scripture to be the plumb line. This will not be, you know, the three of us plus our guests coming on's point of view. This is going to be what Scripture states about the tithe, what it is, what it isn't. So you won't be able to say that them ninjas over at Real Talk Radio is against tithing. What you'll be able to say is, well, Scripture states this about tithing. Because this is one of those topics where we want to be really clear that this is not our own personal opinion and perception in this manner. We want to handle this biblically. Mm-hmm. And the first thing that comes out of people's minds, did I hear Echo? Yeah. Oh, keep talking. We'll let you know. Uh, the first thing that comes out of people's mouth is, y'all just don't want to give. And that's when, when and you hear a lot of uh, that we judge other people. That, that in itself is what true judging is. When people hear us talk about tithing, the first thing that comes out of their mouth is y'all just don't want to give. Y'all stingy. That, that judging because it's just a misunderstanding of what the tithe is. And and all three of us, I can speak this. All three of us agree that tithing is a hundred percent biblical. Agreed. It's a hundred percent biblical. However, the tithing as it's used today is not. The way that it's Agreed. been transformed is not. What God wanted as a tithe was not money. And we're gonna delve into that. We're gonna get into the scriptures and do a lot of more teaching in the second half, but um doing the <laughs> half we're just gonna uh throw some things around but we're going to really dig to the scriptures in the second half when our guest comes on. Because I think it's important for us to be able to uh, address this topic, man, and give you both aspects of it, both sides of the coin, the, the practical along with the, the scriptural application. And one of the, the big issues with the, the practical aspect of it is there's a level of manipulation that goes into the teaching of the tithe. There's a level of guilt and, and peer pressure that goes in. Now, it doesn't take much to give you horror stories regarding the tithe and how people have used it to manipulate. It doesn't take any work to do that. We, we can, I can give you five right off the top of my head of instances where not only have I seen it done, but where I've also been guilty of doing it to other people. Now, I want to be clear, because even when I was in the pulpit, I wasn't a tither. And I wasn't a tither because I was stingy. I was a tither, wasn't a tither because I had, in my own mind, this, this thought that, okay, if God has instructed me to take care of the poor and the widows and to my brother in need, why are these people telling me that I have to give to God? If God has instructed me to do one thing, you're giving me a a completely different argument and line of thinking. Somebody is not right. So what I did was took it upon myself and began to help others in need in that manner. But it's always been an issue, and even to the point of seeing in most communities these number the number of churches within a community. Man, in my own community, within a, I'll say a 10-block radius, there's probably 25 to 30 different churches. No exaggeration. You got big churches, you got storefronts, but there's churches everywhere. But within that 10-block radius where those churches are, you have some of the most impoverished, crime-ridden, 
issue-stricken people that you'll ever see. So all the money that these churches are gathering are doing one of two things. They're either staying in the pockets of the preachers who are receiving it or giving them the benefit of the doubt, because I'm working on that, pray for your boy, they're using it to only facilitate and to create a better environment within their own four walls, because truthfully, the money is not funneling back into the community. So that's an issue that I'm trying to understand and struggle with. So we, we got to be able to sit back and actually have an open conversation about this topic without it turning into a a salvation issue, which I've seen take place on more than one occasion, without a pointing of fingers. Now, here's the thing, too, about the pointing of the fingers aspect, John, the thing that I think we can agree on is that, yeah, people who tithe look at people who give with a side eye, but often the roles are also reversed, that people who don't tithe and are givers look at tithers with a side eye. There's a level of judging that takes place from on both sides at times. John, hello? Yeah. The, there's oh, an yeah. issue that takes place. Yeah, yeah, but boy, you need to be a little bit more able to multitask just a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it's just it's one of those issues, man. And even Jonathan, like you mentioned last week on the the show where everybody said we was going to go to hell for, uh, you mentioned the fifty two dollars that the, the dude was trying to get for his helicopter blades. That manipulation. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's it's a huge epidemic how tithing has not only ruined communities, man, the aspect of how tithing has ruined relationships. I know folks who have split up over tithing because, the, you know, how the pastor is. The pastor said we need to tithe. We got to gotta give, got to give. And the husband's like, no. I done been working all this time. I done took care of my family. I ain't giving that Negro 10%. Mm. Now, for me, I I was a faithful tither. I, mean, I was a faithful tither, and, and I was really tithing out of my lack. Um, mm. but this was back then, and I used to preach it and teach it. Um, but I can tell you, you know, just being honest, I don't care. I wasn't really making that much money. My gross was about uh, every two weeks was about twelve hundred or a little bit more somewhere around there. Uh, it's about twelve hundred, so I was making about six hundred something dollars a week. Um, now, after taxes, after all the um, what do you call it, uh, medical, all the insurance, all the other stuff that my job took out, uniforms, whatever. After all my ch- child support. I would bring home about uh, somewhere around five hundred dollars. This is every two weeks now. Like I said, this is I was tithing out of my lap, so I was bringing it home less than half of what I was making. I was netting less than half of what I was grossing. So I'm grossing twelve hundred, bringing home about five hundred every two. And I got a family to support me, and so I still was tithing off of my gross. So out of this, let's say five hundred fifty. I was still tied like $120. Mm. So, you know what I'm saying? So I, I'm living for two weeks now, mind you, on 300 close to 400 and something dollars every two. Well, my wife was working too, but still, I'm just so for my aspect, I was paying money, tithing out of my lap, because I really didn't have it to get. My child support, you know, uh, it wasn't astronomical, um, but it was uh, $200 every two weeks. On top of all the insurance, you know, insurance is high. If you, you know, working in people su- supplying benefits, you know, insurance can be pretty expensive. So benefits, insurance, uh, taxes, child support, all that's coming out, and I'm still on top of that, paying $120. So I mean, it, it was it was pretty it was rough. It was rough, and and if I got something in the mail, a, a check in the mail, some overpayment or something, I would automatically first thing come out my mouth would be uh, God gave me a mailbox blessing because I was a faithful tither. 
you know, or, or let me run up on some money. Somebody just give me some money. It, I always try to give it and say, well, God done blessed me. God done blessed me because I was tithing. And that couldn't be further from the truth because that was much more in lack than I was in surplus. Mm -hmm. Much, much more. And, and, and I used to, uh -huh, Go ahead. No, because I, I just wanted to hop in and point out the mentality that you are alluding to is how many people who tithe have the mentality that I'm tithing, and in my tithe I'm storing up future blessings. Then when I have a financial issue, because I've been fight, a faithful tither, God's going to reach into the reserve of my faithfulness in tithing and bring me out of this financial issue that I have. But they don't also see the flip side, that when you have that mentality with tithing, that mentality just doesn't stop with money. It goes over to your obedience. It goes over into you not sinning. So I'm going to not sin and do all these great things and help people and all these things as a way of storing up blessings in uh -huh. reserve, so when I do screw up, because I know I still sneak away and, and watch pornography sometimes, when I do store up and screw up, God's going to reach into that reserve and bless me and cover me. Mm. That mentality is, is just so prevalent, John. Yeah. So, so let me ask y'all a question. What do y'all say to the believer who who's a faithful tither to his church, but their church are doing, quote-unquote, good works. They're building schools. They're going out feeding the poor. How, how do you answer those guys? How do you, how do you answer that? I, we should tithe. That's what we're doing. This is where our tithe money goes. This this is why I tithe. What's your answer to those people? My answer to that would be I'm not going to say uh, just because your church is doing good works with the tithe, that it's okay. People who are, and I don't want to use that example, so I won't. It's just a really difficult thing. I, you don't want to say just because something good is happening off of a lie that you should perpetuate the lie. Mm. You, That's good. You, you, you shouldn't, just because something good is taking place out of a negative, no one would continue doing the negative if someone was being abused, but it keeps social workers in jobs and allows them to, perform, to take care of their families. Am I going to say it's okay for the, the abuse mm -hmm. to take place? Wow. Times, police officers. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Mm. So, so basically you would just tell them, um, no, I'm not going to put words in your mouth. Well, what else would you tell them? I would tell them to, to, first of all, I'm going to deal with the scripture aspect. And, again, you know how we do in our conversation when we ask, talk to people. We never tell people to stop doing something, stop going, stop giving. We address the heart issue. We ask them, okay, so what is your motivation for doing this? What, what, are you doing this because you were taught this? Are you doing this because, you know, you feel like God has called you to do this? We address the heart issue. And we I'm, support, I'm, and doing I was, it. I'm doing it because I see what they're doing. They're doing good thing. That's why I'm doing it. Okay. And my response would be, if you stop doing that thing, would they still be helping them out? If there was no tithe, would they still be helping these people out? Is the tithe the engine that drives you doing these things for people, or is it the Spirit of God? Because if it's the Spirit mm. of God, you don't need to have the tithe in place, bro. So one of, my, one of my things is I, I try to uh, bring up why are you giving to the church to do that? God told us to do that. Mm, very good. And, and, and when yeah. I bring that up, they bring up another issue. Well, don't you give to charities? But what's the difference between you giving to a church to do it and you giving to, uh, say, a, a charity to, that does that? What's the difference? That's well, the question. big difference is a lot of the money that you give to the church stays in the church. A big deal of the money, especially if it's a big church. You got a lot of members, so that means you got salaries you got to pay. Uh, even if you don't have a mortgage, if you do have a mortgage, you got a mortgage. If the mortgage is paid off, you don't have a mortgage, but you still got insurance that you got to pay. You still got property taxes, um, uh, salaries, all this stuff that still got to be paid. That's not going to help other people. And for me, when I'm faced with people who like to use that, you know not my church, not my pastor line, 
Um, you know, I try to show them the difference between tithing and giving because there's a huge difference in tithing and giving. And people, well, y'all just splitting hairs. Y'all just playing word games. No, we're not. Tithing is totally different than giving. Very different. Yeah. Very different. Mm -hmm. There was a, there were tithing laws, tithing ordinances, not tithing principles, which we like to use, but there were tithing laws, tithing ordinances, and the substance of the tithe, I think, is what oftentimes gets lost. So I would try to, you know, try to at least show the person through scriptures the difference between tithing and giving. Because if you look in the New, in the New Testament, anywhere where you're seeing people giving money, it always went to help who or what? People. Mm -hmm. Never went to a building. Never. And I think, and I think that's where a lot of people are, who are kind of on the on the fence or borderline with this thing is, they, they separate tithing from giving, and they lump it in together, and they cannot separate the two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But one of the logics, man, that I hear people say when I've had conversations with them about tithing, they always say something like this: "Well, if there was no tithe, people wouldn't give." We need to have rules in place to provide a structure in order for people to give. I've actually heard one person say, man, you know doggone well, if these churches didn't preach tithing, if we didn't tithe, black folk wouldn't give. <laughs> and I was absolutely offended. I was offended on a couple fronts. <laughs> but I was offended with the thought process that if that mentality right there is so anti-gospel. That's, that mentality is so anti-Christ. Nowhere do we see Jesus putting rules and regulations in place in order for people to do something. He did the exact opposite. He, he removed rules and regulations and gave us the Holy Spirit, which allows us to walk in truth. But I keep saying that tithing is just a symptom of a deeper issue. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's just a symptom, man, and it's... And, and, and if you're joining us today, we are going to get into some scriptures in the second half, so we're not just, you know, you're not thinking we're just sitting here rambling, but we are going to get into some scriptures. We have a, a guest coming on. He has a website. Um, his name is Gary Arnold. His website is tithing101.com if you want to go there uh, and check him out. Uh, so he's coming on the second half. This is where we're going to really get into the teaching aspect. We're going to hit up the scriptures. Uh, and we're going to hit it hard, man, because so we, it won't just be our opinions and our thoughts. We're going to use Scripture, as Elder said, as the standard, is the plumb line for where we get these things from. Right, and right now we're just doing Probably talking. Probably exegeted, yeah. Right, right we're now just we're talking, talking. And, and, like, talking is a good thing. Without us talking about certain things, their questions won't arise. But when we talk about these things, it makes people stop and, and, and pause and, and to think, well, you know what? That does make sense. Let me look at this a little deeper. But that'll never happen if we never had a conversation. Right. And that's, that's, and, uh, go ahead, Jonathan. I'm sorry. I was going to say, that's really what got me to really start studying it. Like I said, I thought it was it was mandatory. And I see Tawanda say the same thing. She did it for 17 years. I did it because I thought that's what we were supposed to do. I actually taught it. And if you listen to the radio show, you probably heard me say that, the last sermon I ever preached in church was on tithing and why we should tithe. And that's just so ironic to me. That's the last sermon I ever preached on was about tithing. So what I would do, I would use isogetic scriptures, and people read into the scriptures on, uh, on tithing, because I always looked into uh, Malachi 3, you know, where it talks about, will a man rob God, have you robbed me in tithes and offers? And I was like, that proves that we are supposed to tie. That's, I'm telling you, that was my thought process. But then my uh, big brother, John Almighty, um, <laughs> <laughs> we had a conversation, and he was just asking me just questions that really made me think and really made me go study. And so I went back, and, and I really, really studied it, and I was, like, really shocked and surprised that when I actually took the time to study it for myself, not – John didn't say you need to do this. No, I actually went back and studied it. And from what I got, I actually wrote a four-page letter, scripture, and all this, and I gave it to my pastor. 
like, don't ask me why I did it. So I don't know why I gave it to him. Like he was gonna change his mind, but I did that, and <laughs> and, and and I mean, it, it was an eye opener. It was, eye, and like I said, that was my Pandora's box for me to leave uh, the church system because of that. Ah, uh, see, there you go, there you go, and that that's one of the things that I wanted to hit on too, because when you get to a place where, see, a tithing we stated earlier is a symptom of a bigger issue. Another one of the symptoms that we see is biblical illiteracy. The fact of the matter is many people who go to church faithfully, whether it be on Sundays or whether it be two or three times a week, do not know how to study scripture. They have no idea how to read it in context, to look at the culture, to understand who the author and writers of these particular books are we're talking to so once you begin to be able to learn how to study scripture other issues are going to come up also now now once i understand that tithing has been lost a lie rather i immediately begin to question other things i i have to question now where did the 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 church structure come from how how did it get set up Understanding that tithing is false begins to open people's eyes to other falsehoods that's taking place within the church culture. You really, it, it, began, it, it will lead you down a path that honestly, Jonathan, I think one of the reasons why people choose not to deal with these type of topics that we talk about a lot of times is out of fear. Like, yo, if I come to find out that these people have been teaching these false things, whether intentionally or unintentionally, my faith will be shattered. And to those people who operate in that type of fear, I say to you, if your faith is shattered because you heard the truth, you may not have no strong faith. I almost said may not have no faith, but I don't want to go that far. You may, your faith is very, very weak. If something that God, if something that man says has the ability to shatter what God has done, man, we we, we got to start examining faith now. We we got to get to the, the the foundation of these issues. Is oftentimes the church culture, and we're not saying everybody has created a false and absolutely idolatrous image of God. As much as what we see within the church culture is not God, man. It, it has nothing to do with who Jesus is or what he's done. And unfortunately, most of the people who attend these churches, man, are worshiping a false God. There's no other way of summing it up. But dealing with the tithing aspect, it ha we have to be really careful with this because, again, People tend to get emotional about this, and and John and Jonathan, I think that's another one of the issues, man, when it comes to these topics, that a lot of times tradition and people's emotions are so wrapped up with this topic that it prevents them from looking at it for themselves. Because when you go to a church that teaches tithing and you come to find out that tithing is a false doctrine that has been taught, in your church, where all your friends and family have gone, and it's your family's church, now you have to make a decision. Either I'm going to remain here while they teach these things, or I do mm -hmm. something differently. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> now I can speak a little bit. You know, when I first, when I went to my pastor with the thing about tithing, we had a long, long, long conversation. And, you know, here's, here's what the bottom line was. He said, you don't have to tithe. I can't make you tithe. I can't make anybody do anything. But, you know, here's the booty. Right. Here's the booty. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Right. You know, I, I was elder at the church, and I was over the prison ministry. I was over the praise and worship team, and I was over the music ministry. So I was like, well, you had the people who actually ran it, but I was like the elder over those things. Um, and so he said, okay, you don't have to pay tithe, but you can't do anything. You can go to the jail, but you can't speak. You know what I'm saying? Um, and, you know, you're no longer over the air. Basically, he sat me down. He said, you don't have to tithe. You should still give, but you can't do anything in the church. 
basically I just come and see, be a member, you know. I'm not going to tell you you can't come because the doors of the church are always open. So he's like, you don't have to tithe, but you can't do nothing. As if I'm just supposed to sit there and just come to church, just sit there and be a, a I hate to even use this phrase, a regular member. I hate to use that, but that's really what I thought of. And uh, so I actually had another conversation with him, and I was like, I'm leaving. I'm not coming. You know, I, I ain't never coming back. And he was like, well, why don't you at least come back this one last time and let me bless you, you know, before you leave. Let me just send you off with my blessing. Mm. <laughs> so I said, okay. Set up. Yeah, it was a setup. It was a real setup. So I actually came back that day, and guess what the Sunday school class was about? Tithing. Yeah, that was about tithing. People don't want to tithe. It's right there in the scripture. The people, you should pay your tithe. And I sat there listening to that, seething in my seat. Like he was trying to take everything I just said and trying to twist it to make people not pay tithe. So sat through the whole service. He talked about money. Okay, service was over. He was supposed to call me up front and pray for me and send me on my merry way, like I've seen him do with other people, you know, who had left for one or whatever reason, people moving out of town, so he'd give them this blessing, whatever. He never called me up, which he said he was going to do. So after service, he calls me in his office. It was me, him, and another elder. So we in there, and that's when he rips into me, let me have it. I ain't no real man. Uh, that's when he cursed me. I uh, said, whatever I do, um, I'm not going to prosper. Anything I put my hands to is not going to prosper. Um, it's ministry-wise. Um, it's going to fail until I come back to apologize to him in front of the congregation. You know, it's going to all fail. That's why I, last week showed cussing and those scriptures that people use. He really cussed me out without cussing. So, you know, he told me off all this stuff, man. He said I wasn't no man. I ain't no real elder, all this good stuff. I need a covering, you know, he's re removing this covering, and I need to get under somebody's cover. It just, you know all the stuff they try to tell you. So all this because I told him I wasn't going to tie it anymore. All of this. And I was not going to just sit there and listen to it. I wasn't going to sit there and let, let you teach this kind of stuff, so I'd rather remove myself. You know what I'm saying? So that, that was what happened to me. Go ahead, John. So I was going to say this two things. One, um, a lot of people tithe out of fear. Mm. They tithe out of fear. They tithe out of uh, uh, obligation. And they get this line, how is the church going to survive uh -oh. without the tithe? Uh-oh. So how do you answer that? You Let me answer something real quick before that. <laughs> so... <laughs> and I love to use it. So if the tithe, if the church is only surviving because of the tithe, or because of the money, so if you remove the money then, what was really keeping that church together? Is it money or was it the spirit of God? So what's, what's keeping your church together? And if you're a tither, if you're listening to the show, uh, what's keeping your church together? Is it the tithe or is it the Spirit of God? Well, you need money to, to run the ministry and all this stuff, but you show me in the scriptures where it said that we're supposed to have all these big buildings. I, I read in the scriptures where it said they met from house to house. That's what I read. It said they met from, in Acts. It said they met from house to house. Nobody ever, who told you to go get a big building? Who told you that? So and if money is the only the glue, if money is the glue that's holding your church together, then that's not the spirit of God that's holding it together. It's the money. And then you see it, though. And just like you just said, man, when people tithe and they do these, you know, building funds and all these type of things, and this is what I'm going to say as far as the building fund. If you got a leaky roof and your toilet is backed up and it smells like, you know what, all throughout your assembly, Yo, stand in the pulpit and say, yo, the plumbing messed up, dog. We got to get this fixed. We need a couple of dollars to get the, get the plumbing fixed. Don't stand there and use scripture out of context as a way of manipulating people into giving in order for things to get done. Oftentimes what you see is these churches trying to get bigger buildings and better facilities as a way of drawing people into the facility in order for people to come to know Christ.
Maybe. So what you're telling people is you're you're manipulating people, and you're actually you're you're uh, oh man, you're manipulating people, but you're also insulting their intelligence by saying the only reason that you're gonna come here to my church to hear Jesus is because I got a build a big building and I got a nice youth ministry. Mm-hmm. And the choir because can if, sing real good. And the choir can sing because if I didn't have those things right there, you wouldn't want. You should be insulted that somebody would say something like that to you. But then these churches do that type of thing, and they begin to live outside of their abilities financially. Because they they look at it as godliness is gain. And they look at it as if, um, you know, the better type of building that we have, the bigger building, you know, the nice plush carpet, these nice comfortable pews, you know, we got this big old stereo sound system and, you know, the big plasma TVs that everybody can read their words off of when we're doing praise and worship. You know, we got the nice sound system, the, you know, brand new guitars, you know, we got all this stuff, you know, the best drums, you know, we got all this stuff. And they think it makes God look better because we have all of these things. Uh We can buy all of these things. So when you're giving your money, you keep giving your money so that we can keep doing this for God. And what is it? It's entertainment, really. It's for entertainment purposes. They should label it entertainment purposes only. Um, Basically, you know, so I went to a church back in January. That was my. I just went to visit with my friend because he had invited me. And they was talking about money. Now, I can tell you the sanctuary was off the hook. I mean, it was that, that church was nice. It was a nice building. I'm telling you, they had a gang room off to the side. They had a coffee shop up front. <clears throat> they had the stage lighting. I'm telling you, like, like you're going at a concert, like literally the lights going back and forth. No strobe light, but they had a lighting. I mean, the sound system was nice. It was this pastor had a little cordless, you know, a little lapel mic. It was nice. But you know what I thought when I was sitting in the midst of that? This is all entertainment. This is nice, but it's not necessary for anybody to hear the gospel. It's not necessary for that. None I, I, of I, I, listen, it's man, and I, I struggle, honestly, when I see churches have, you know, two or three church vans with the logo all shiny out in a parking lot, but you have members within your church who are going without I, I, I just, I can't understand. It's like me having a mansion, but some of my family members are homeless. Mm-hmm. I won't do what I can in order to help them or even allow them to stay in one of my rooms in my mansion. But you don't have anything where you're allowing people to use the church van to get back and forth to work. Right. Or they knowing that one. And they pay for it, and knowing that somebody in your church don't have a job because they don't have transportation, but you won't do what you can to allow them to do something that they have finance to get on their feet. That's, it's just, it's not adding up. It's like you having somebody who lives in your house is supposed to be your roommate, and they making all this money, but they don't want to pay no bills. So why should you give to church? <clears throat> uh, mm. I, <laughs> yeah, I'm at a loss of words because I I want to tell people they shouldn't, but I'm not gonna tell like Elvis. I'm not gonna tell you that you shouldn't. I'm not gonna tell okay, you. I'm not gonna say that. Why wouldn't you give to a church? Scripture doesn't you, teach it. Me personally? Yeah. Why wouldn't you give to a church? <laughs> how 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 is me giving money to a church helping somebody? Because Directly. we give. Because we uh we build buildings and we feed the poor, we got a food. Okay, they, they feed the poor. They give the coat drive and all this stuff. Uh, they they send money on missions field. But for me, you ask me, and I'm just telling you, it's not helping somebody. I'd rather give that money to my niece. Uh, you know who is a single mother. I'd rather give it to uh my nephew who's, who's a young man coming up. You know, and then still in high school, doing good grades. Give it to my own kids. You know, when they do their chores, get, bring home these A's and B's, I'd rather get that money where it would be useful, where I know it would be useful, instead of being wasted on a building, on maintenance, insurance, But it ain't wasted. Calories. But it ain't wasted. We feed the poor. So you give it to the church, it's feeding the poor. Uh, How much more can you feed the poor if there was no building? 
I actually Go heard a, a good uh, rebuttal to that right there um, where somebody said they talked about when the alabaster box oh, and she broke it and poured it over and one of the was it Judas somebody got angry and was like man we could have used that alabaster that oil for something and she just wasting it on his feet and they try to use that to say well which you you don't dictate what the money goes to. You just give it. So they they equated the oil with tithing. That has yeah. got to be one of the most ignorant uses <laughs> of scripture that I have ever heard before in my life. That has absolutely nothing on any level to do with giving money. I've, I've heard this about some churches. I've heard this, that the church must be biblically financed. So they don't do, uh, they don't do like, uh, bake sales or sell chicken dinners or do car washes. They don't do any of those things to raise money. They say they got to be biblically financed. How? Through tithes and offerings. Biblically financed. Um, he, he's so wrong on all the, that's just so much wrong in that. And this it's is like I the say, term, I heard the term, biblical sorry, church but, growth. No, I was saying so much wrong with that, just that phrase, just as wrong as biblical church growth, something's wrong with that phrase as well, but biblically financed, what? The church has to be biblically financed. What, is, what does that really mean? What scripture are you going to use? The only thing I saw, were, the only people where I saw people giving is, I think it's in Exodus. Where Moses, uh, the people were giving free will offerings, and Moses said, "That's enough. You don't have to give no more." You know, the people give more than what's needed, and that's how they built the sanctuary. That's how they built the temple. It was through free will offerings. So, if you want to give your money to help build and maintain your church, then do that. But it's not a tithe, and you're not required to do that, and you're not really helping people. What you're doing is helping keeping the building running and paying keeping the building salaries. running. Exactly. If your church takes up a tithe and that tithe is not going back to the very people who are in that building and in that surrounding community, that's not tithing, it's stealing. Ain't no other way. If, if you're going to use that mentality that this money is for God's kingdom and his kingdom building, which is that, just by the way, you have to be able to use that money to go back into the very thing that you proclaim God is using it for. If your pastor is riding around driving a luxury car that he has gotten off of tithing and folks are walking, there is a problem. Because... Scripture says the least of these. Let's let's make sure. And, and this this right here, this topic for me is a very very frustrating one, and it really makes me feel some type of way because I I cannot see it on any other level outside of stealing and manipulation and flat out abuse of the people who are within the context of the, those so-called assemblies. It's, you are giving your hard-earned money under the guise of saying, I'm giving to God, to another man, trusting that this man is going to use that money to do what God said he's told him to do. That's flat-out foolishness. Mm -hmm. But this, the church is the only institution where people are blindly giving money and just allowing that money to do whatever they want to do. We have people who will go to Walmart and pay, you know, $23.98 and let them not get the right amount of change back. They go at that doggone receipt and will get to the house and will drive back to the doggone Walmart to lay people out over a couple pennies. But we give money to the church thinking that we are giving to God. Why in the world did we ever fall for that mentality that we are giving 
to God as if God needs your 10%. Mm. To build the kingdom. That's <laughs> right. Money answer is all things. <laughs> Be my covenant partner. Mm. Yeah. Kingdom building. We, we, we might do, need to do a show on kingdom building uh, because we're not caught. No, we ain't. I'll hit it right here and cancel that right now. There is no such thing as kingdom building. The kingdom is already here. You just can't see it. Jesus said the kingdom is without observation, and it is already here within you. We are called to be kingdom ambassadors, representatives of that kingdom, not kingdom builders. I don't want anybody to be mad who's listening to the show, though, who doesn't tithe anymore. But just for a minute, I want you to do a little calculate in your head. You know, carry the one, use your fingers and toes <laughs> if you need to, and, and add up the amount of money that you have tied over the years. Mm. Just, 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 <laughs> just think about how much you've given over you know, the years. Thanks. <laughs> Tawanda, I know you mad. I know you mad, Tawanda. <laughs> I'm just, just, I'm mad over that. My check being five hundred and forty dollars, and I'm still tithing one hundred twenty dollars out of that. Yeah, Rick, I, I'm you was still tithing, mad about that. Cause you was, cause you was tithing on your gross, huh? Yeah, I was tithing <laughs> on my gross. It's not your debt. That's what I was taught. And I, I want to know where they get that from. Too. I'm gonna tell y'all how when I used to tithe, what I used to do. Cause I was, I never tithed on my gross. I always tithed on things I controlled. Uh, I never, like, I would get my pay stub and I would look at it, and anything that I control, like my uniform expenses, my insurance. Things like that, my 401k, I always tithed on that thing. But like the the uh, taxes, I didn't count that. I didn't tithe on that because I said I'm gonna get my income tithe when I get my income tax. So I'm not that's double tithe. I'm not doing that. You know, <laughs> that's how I was. So you was. Did you just hold on, hold on. This dude just said that he was double tithing off of his income tax. No, if I if I if I tithe for my growth and tithe when I got my income tax check back, see that was double tithing. Wow. Yo, man, let's take these callers, man. We got a couple callers. Yeah, callers. And yeah, we got callers, and I know some of these folk are going to be uh a little mad. Don't don't be mad at me because you gave your money away. Just before you come on the air, before I let you talk. Don't come <laughs> on here cussing us out because you're mad at them. Don't don't don't, don't do it. Call her from the four zero eight, you're live on the air. Four zero eight, what's on your mind? Revolution, brothers, revolution. This is brother Ray Kwan. <laughs> Ray oh, Kwan, what's going good, on? homie? This brother soccer soccer brother in the face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Soccer hey, in the um, I just want to uh, chime in. Um, I, I gave in, I gave over about a hundred thousand dollars from the age of seventeen to thirty as hold a child. Hold, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, bro. <laughs> hold on, because I almost just spit my coffee out on my laptop. Uh, <laughs> did you just say a hundred thousand yeah, dollars? over. From over. I'm sorry. Over a hundred thousand dollars from the age of seventeen. To thirty? That's thirteen. Sure years. did, bro. Sure did. <laughs> wow. I wish I was your wow. pastor. I swear. I was your <laughs> so it's, it's Fred you Price. I know who my pastor was. Fred <laughs> Price. <laughs> Mister Get Money himself. So, Go ahead, sir. I'm sorry uh, to interrupt. Mister Jesus committed suicide. Well, that's, that's what that was. Yeah. So so anyway, um, you know, ironically, uh, I was getting quote unquote blessed. Right, I my my income would go up around about ten thousand every year, right? So I never questioned it, you know. So, but but when you get exposed to true exegesis, and you know, I got exposed to uh, I guess it was probably G. Craig did a message on it, and then I had to go back and uh, you know start reading the scripture in context, and then that truly opened my eyes to absolutely everything. I'm like, wow, this whole thing is a scam, right? And and I'm I'm a big part of it because I'm a minister, right? So mm. I, I, it really it, it really broke my heart because uh, I I devoted my whole life to that, you know, at 17, and you know to find out that this whole system is a sham and is a way to the pyramids game to get your money and to, mm. to, to actually have control over you, 
that, that truly, I, I, I think I'm still brokenhearted today. And, and listening to y'all and the fellowship with y'all is, is, is my, my therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I'm just, and, and I'm not trying to clown you, so don't take it that way. But your story is just one of the many stories of which you have, when you're talking about the amount of money that you have given, over hey, hey, 100,000. Go ahead. Sure. Can I give a quick testimony, uh, though? Uh, sure you can. Basically, I was praying about all the money that I gave, right? And God showed me something, right? I, I had bought a house with my, my former wife, and and uh, we had to short sell it. So so basically, uh, the difference was the amount of ties that I gave, gave over the years. So I was hmm. about to, one of my job with the government, I was about to go to Afghanistan or Iraq to try to make that money, which would have put me in danger mm. and, and, you know. So, so God mm -hmm. said, look, I got you, right? I got you. You know, you do things with a pure heart, even though you may do it ignorantly, I still got you. So so yeah. God is faithful no matter what these pimps and, you know, these, these, these wolves and predators try to do. If you do things with a pure heart, I believe, in my personal experience, that he has a way to, you know, recompense or, you know, get that thing back to you, you know, that, that's just my opinion. But let me ask you this question, though, because you mentioned how your income would go up in the midst of you tithing. So were you attributing the fact that your income was going up on the fact that you were tithing and being faithful? Well, I, I, I thought it was, it was attributed to tithing, giving, and living holy, right? So, mm. and, and mind you, mind you, I know you guys talk about pornography a lot, and, and I, I deal with that today, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and I've always de dealt with that for, for the, since I was probably 11 or whatever. So, mm -hmm. so you know, I would slip up here and there, and now I think God had cursed me. But in, in terms of the financial, I've always, always, you know, with, with, I mean, we was, I guess when I was last tithing, I probably was my wife and I. We was probably paying around six, seven hundred dollars a month, right? On top of giving to poor people, we see, you know, on top of just hey, you know, they're having a conference here, right? So I mean, uh, one year I probably gave around thirty-five percent of my income, you know, to the to the to the um, institution, right? So. Yeah, it, it 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 it's very cunning, right? It's it's very cunning, and and if you yeah. know, that's why I, I I'm grateful for this show because you know when you're dialoguing with people rather than preaching at people like you're yeah. as an expert, I think that's where true teaching really comes from, right? Just uh -oh. that's why Jesus just spoke to his disciples like normal men, right? Even though that he was their Lord. Right, he washed their feet. He he became like them, you know. Because when somebody's over you, you have this awe and this this this. this oh, this dude knows everything about the scripture. He's a mighty man of God, you know. Concept, and it's like, <laughs> wait a minute, guy, you you have sin just like I do, right? So, and then they yeah. you know go back and forth. Well, I'm a man. It's like, wait a minute, you wasn't a man <laughs> when I was giving you that money, right? Like, right, no, right, you can't have right. It both ways. right. <laughs> I'll let y'all go though. Bless y'all. All right, man. Appreciate you. Appreciate it, Raekwon. Right, Appreciate you, bro. All right, man. And around the next too. Let's take this, this next <laughs> caller, man. Caller from the four two five four two five. You're live on the air with Real Talk Radio, talking about the guy. How you Sage. feeling? What's up, Sage? How uh, you doing, man? homie? I'm I'm doing all right. Uh, can't really talk long because I'm actually here training for Afghanistan. <laughs> Um, it's interested in listening to the last caller because uh, we kind of mirror each other. Um, I couldn't tell you how much I paid because honestly, I didn't want to do the math because I would have got on here cussing. <laughs> 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 but um, unlike um, unlike him, you know, 
I'm I'm so I'm so deep in debt, and in, and it wasn't just from paying constantly paying ties or whatnot. There was a bunch of other poor decisions that I made, and you know I do have to go on this deployment to get myself out of, out of this out of this rat hole of it. Um, I just <laughs> think constantly learning about it. You know, there's been many comparisons I was made, and I'm pretty sure you guys have got into it already of how. You know, some churches say you have, you should tithe like Jacob did. Well, I mean, Jacob was <laughs> making a, was making a deal. When you read it for yourself, you realize Jacob was the only reason why he tithe was because he was trying to make a deal with God. So if I'm supposed to model model my giving after that, something is dead wrong. It never, honestly, it never even said that he paid that tithe. <laughs> said he said he would do it. Yeah, he said he said he would do it. Uh, and he just recited what God already told him he was gonna do. <laughs> yeah, but go ahead, Sage, bro. We listen to you. I'm sorry. Oh no, it's quite alright. Then there's the then there's the whole "What a man robbed God" speech. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Honestly, honestly, I've been learning a little bit more about that, and most recently, I learned that that wasn't even for the people. That was for the so-called ministers accepting it and not giving back to the people. There you go. And it's, and you know, and when you learn this stuff, it really makes you want to go ahead, grab grab a baseball bat, and pull an old school ice cube, and say, you know what, y'all need to go ahead and pay up this month, this so called money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I, you, that's what it, that's what it makes <laughs> you want to do. An old pull an old school ice cube before you start making them family moves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, but in the end, <clears throat> but in the end, and I'm gonna leave y'all with this, you know. Above everything else, God, God has given us, you know, common sense. And bottom line, we need to use, as Mama would say, we got to use the sense that God gave us. You're not going to just put your money, you shouldn't put your money anywhere and not know where it's going. I mean, it's, it's written right in the scripture that we are to be good stewards. If you're just putting your money, you know, if you're, giving your, if you're constantly giving your money to a parent, a pimp is going to do what he's going to do with that money. You know, and that's that's just a, real. A pimp's we have to pay for ourselves. <laughs> You're right. All right, Sage, bro. As always, man, we appreciate you coming through, man. Thank you, uh, for having me. I got to get back to this train. Be careful out there, man. Be careful, homie. Okay. Hey, uh, we thank all the callers for calling in so far. Um, we're going to go ahead and take this quick break. Um, we're going to put a little fun song. Uh, it's funny to us, but, uh, you know, it's serious to the people who did it. Um, Y'all see what, what I'm talking about. But um, right after the break, we're going to bring on our special guest, Mr. Gary Arnold, and we're going to finally get into the scriptures and do some teaching. We did a lot of talking. Hallelujah. Teaching. So right after the break, we're going to bring on our special guest. Uh, Y'all got the song queued up? Because I don't have it. I'm just running my mouth. Uh, See, that's what's wrong with you. Always playing. <laughs> Jonathan, where you at, dude? All right, I got it. See, that's why he fired. Him, you, <laughs> all right, all right, all right, right. <laughs> yeah. All right, we go right up right after the break, y'all. We'll bring on our special guest. In today's economy, accountants get a really bad rap. <laughs> bad so, rap. You know, we thought we weren't going to fight it. We're just going to claim that. And so we are, we are redeeming the bad rap that accountants get. Well, this doesn't feel good. Perhaps I'm best off with giving a little distance to this moment. No, no, un unless you want to join us, yo. No. No. <laughs> Apple bottom key. <laughs> What's up, people? What's up? Yo, white teeth in the house. They call me no sense. Yeah, that little bin up in here. Every day in the mail, I get nothing but bills. I could rap all day about my financial ills. 
Money comes in and goes right back out. I know that you know what I'm talking about. My wife just keeps cranking up the heat. And three times a day, my kids want to eat. Creeper! But listen up now to what I got to say. What I do every Friday when I get my pay. Before I buy the groceries or pay the rent, I gotta give God his full 10%. Probably because people weren't tithing. Mm. So they probably had to come up with something to say, we got to get these people to tithe. What's hip right now? Hip-hop is. Let's do this. Let's do this. Okay. Y'all ready? Do yep. it, bro. All right. Right about now, we're going to bring on our special guest, Mr. Gary J. Arnold from tithing101.com. And our... Good morning, Good morning to all of you. Good morning, brother. How are you? I'm doing great. If you can put up with my allergies and possibly a frog in my throat now and then, so if I start <laughs> coughing or sneezing, please put up with me. <laughs> <laughs> we sure will. Thank you for coming on today. Oh, I just thank you. I thank God for opening this door for me uh, to give me a chance to come on and, and uh, do teaching on this topic that, um, although a lot of teaching has been done on tithing, I don't think a lot of people have heard what I have to say. All right. So let me start out here. Just about any topic you take in school, there's always a prerequisite. 
before you can uh, take literature, you have to know how to read. Before you take algebra, you have to know arithmetic. Well, there are prerequisites, believe it or not, before a person can really learn what the biblical tithe is all about. And the first thing we need to understand, when we read the Bible, when we read the scriptures in the English language, King James Version is what I normally use, we have to understand that we cannot use a modern-day dictionary to look up the words. When we don't understand or we want to know what is really being said, we have to go back to what the meaning of the word was when the scriptures were translated into English for King James. And a good example of that is the word tithe. Mm -hmm. When the King James Version was being uh, translated into English, the word tithe meant a tenth or tenth part. It had nothing to do with God. It had nothing to do with the church. It had nothing to do with religion. It's a mathematical term. Tenth. That's it. It's nothing else. Man has taken that word and totally changed the meaning. So if you look at a dictionary today, you'll see a totally different meaning. Uh, it'll say something like a tenth part of something paid as a voluntary contribution or as a tax, especially for mm -hmm. the support of a religious establishment. But I went back to my mother's dictionary she had in college, 1938 edition, and just back that far, that's not that many years ago, the definition of tithe was tenth part or any small part of produce or profits. Produce or profits. Wages are not produce, and wages are not profits. So just going back to 1938, wages would not be considered part of a tithe, according to that particular dictionary. My research shows that no church ever taught anybody to tithe from their income prior to 1870. We're talking about 143 years ago. That's not that long ago. Mm. Tithe is a mathematical term. And if you, the best way to understand what the Bible's talking about when we read the scriptures on tithing is to substitute the word tenth every time you see the word tithe. When you do that, it takes this whole religion thing of tithe out and gets it down to the mathematical term, which is what it really is. So when we go to Genesis, well, let's not even go to Genesis yet. There's two sure. other words we have to understand before we even get to tithing. There are two other words. We have to understand the definition of income, because in church, what does the pastor say? He says, you tithe on your income, you tithe on your gross income, or you tithe on your net income, depending on the pastor. I doubt that very many pastors even know the definition of gross income or net income, let alone income, since it's, it's an accounting term. And yeah. since I have a Bachelor of Science degree in accounting, I caught this right off in the church that the, the task pastor was saying you tithe on your gross income. Well, gross income includes a lot of things that does not show up on your paycheck or on your W-2 form. So mm -hmm. uh, very few people have ever tithed on their true gross income. Uh, so we, we need to know the definition of, 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 of income. Uh, and actually, the best place you even find the definition is in the Internal Revenue Code, because that's where income matters when you file your tax return. Uh, and Income actually includes everything unless it's excluded, anything that you receive, compensation for services, including fringe benefits, uh, interest, dividends, rents, royalties. Now, so to go into the King James Version, the word income is not used. It is not there. That does not mean they did not have income, because they did have income. They yeah. had wages. They had wages. In Genesis 31, 41, you'll see that the word wages used. Uh, they had income. They had money. In Genesis, you'll see where 
Abram purchased land with money. You'll see where Jacob purchased land with money. Uh, they had interest on loans. So income, it's, an, it's, a, uh, it's important to understand what income is. The other word we have to offset income with is asset. You need to understand what the word asset means. That also does not appear in the King James Version of the Bible, but they had assets. Assets, I'll read from Webster's Dictionary. Uh, it can be a single item of ownership, having exchange value. Some examples given in the dictionary are uh, fixtures, machinery, real estate. Uh, so what I, what I do is I, I start out my teaching by, let's, let's give some examples of things and determine are they wages or are they assets. Uh, sure. I, I, I take that back. Are they income or are they assets? First thing, the wages of a carpenter, that's going to be income. Those are wages. Mm -hmm. A rental house, a rental house is an asset. The rent you receive from that rental would be income. Trees are assets. If you get fruit from the trees and you sell those fruits, the fruit, that would be income from the sale of the fruit. Cattle, mm -hmm. animals, they're assets. But the sale of the animals, which you receive, would be the income. Mm -hmm. Now, we have God saying in Deuteronomy 8, 18, and I'm going to read from the NIV to make it easier to understand what he's saying. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your forefathers as it is today. God gave us the power, the ability to get or produce wealth. In other words, God gives us the ability to work and earn a living. God gives us that ability to labor. When we work, it's our labor doing the work, not God's. He gave us the ability to do that. It's important to understand the distinction between our labor and God's labor. Man cannot make crops. Man can mm -hmm. cultivate the land, plant the seed, water the seed, but man cannot make the fruit grow on the vines or the trees. Man cannot make olive oil. Man can press the olives to get the oil out of it, but man couldn't make the olives. Man cannot make a house. God gives us the materials. Man merely puts it together. So when we get into the tithe, we need to figure out and understand is what God was commanding as a tithe, did that come from his labor or did that come from our labor? Was it from income or was it from assets? And that's so important to understand. If you don't understand that, then you haven't a clue as to what the biblical tithe really was. Now, the first time tithe is mentioned is in Genesis 14, where Abram gave a tenth of the war spoils to King Melchizedek. Yeah. Now, we'll have pastors twist that around every which way. There are several things here. First of all, Abram, not Abraham, gave that tenth. Now, Abram <laughs> and Abraham is the same person, but not at the same time. Abram gave the tenth before God changed his name to Abraham, before God had a covenant with Abraham. So you cannot come and say, Abraham gave that tenth out of faith. Now why is that and important, Gary? And be biblically correct. Well, why is that and important just, for the listeners? That's very important because pastors will say, Abraham, the father of faith, Abraham gave a tenth, we should give a tenth. Well, mm. Abraham did it before he had the covenant. So God didn't tell him to do it in a covenant. The scriptures do not tell us why Abraham gave the tenth. Mm -hmm. We cannot say and be correct that Abraham tithed before that event or after that event as Abraham or Abraham. 
On the other hand, we cannot say that Abraham or Abraham only tithed once in his life, which I hear a lot of people say. We can't say that because the Bible doesn't tell us. But if we add either of those two, we're adding to the word. So we cannot use a one-time example of giving war spoils, which Abraham himself said didn't belong to him. We can't use that and come up with doctrine that now we should give a tenth of our income. Because there is no example in the scriptures of Abraham or Abraham giving a tenth of his income to anybody. It's mm -hmm. not there. So we're making it up. When we say that he tithed one time or he tithed more than one time, all we know is the scriptures give us one example, and that one example, Abraham had already said to God, I'm not going to keep any of this. He didn't want any of it. He didn't keep any of it. A tenth went to Melchizedek. The other 90% went back to where it came from. If you really read the story of what happened here, when Abram went to war to recover his nephew Lot and others and the goods that were stolen, it's, it's Abraham was returning stolen property to their owners. That's really what the story is all about. And that's not what is taught in the church today, that you go out and recover stolen property and give a tenth to the church and give the other 90% back to where it was stolen from. But that's what yeah. you would have to do if you're going to follow Abram's example. Yeah, you, let you me just, jump in here real quick, uh, Gary. I just want to say because they use that because they'll concede the point that tithing was under the law, and I know you're probably going to get into that a little later. Um, they use that to say that tithing, well, we concede that point that it was under the law, but tithing existed before the law, and they used Abram as that example to pound that point home, and that's just Correct. wrong. Correct. Yeah, so go ahead. Sorry whole, for Go ahead. That's okay. Uh, the problem with their argument is, one problem with it is, they say tithing was before the law. That's because they're using the word tithe incorrectly to begin with. Tithing mm. was a mathematical term. Not only was tenth before the law, so was fourth, and so was fifth, and so <laughs> was one percent, and so was a hundred percent. Those are all before the law, too. It's a mathematical term, and they have put this, this, uh, this belief into people that tithe means something other than a mathematical term, and therefore they say, Abraham tithed before the law. Well, another problem with that is, they'll say he tithed before the law, then tithing's in the law, uh, now the law has ended, we go back to before the law. Well, we, they don't want to go back to everything else that was before the law. Mm -hmm. That's number yep. one. And yep. number two, in Numbers 31, under the law, God did not require a tenth of war spoils. So what Abraham did wasn't even codified later. It wasn't in the law. God actually took... Uh, approximately 1.1% of war spoils that went to the Levites, not, not a tenth. So what Abraham did, God did not affirm in the law. It's, it's totally outside the law. Uh, it has nothing to do with God's tithe. It's just a way, it's, it's doing things backwards. It's coming up with a premise, we need money, now let's go into the scriptures and find something we can use to get money out of people. Instead of looking at the scriptures to see what they say, they're looking at what they want the scriptures to say, and then they take it out of context. And they'll say, Abram tithe, uh, a tithe of all, where it's clarified in the book of Hebrews chapter 7, the all means war spoils. And if you read the story, Abram was on his way back from battle. He didn't go mm. home and pick up everything and bring back a tenth of everything. So it's obvious in context it's talking about the war spoils. And, I, and I'm not going to get into this today uh, because of restrictions of time, but just to, to let people know, Abram gave a tenth of the net war spoils, not the gross. And under the law, the Levitical tithe, uh, 
the tenth that went to the priesthood was on the net, not the gross. And very quickly on that, Abraham gave on the net because his, his men had already eaten part of the spoils. He gave a tenth of what was left. So that would be the net, not the gross. Under the mm. priesthood tithe, under the law, the, uh, the scriptures say that the farmer was not to harvest all the way out to the corners. They were to leave that for the poor. They also were to not pick up the, the, uh, the fruit that had fallen to the ground. That would be the gleanings. That was to be left for the poor. So right there, we're down to a net and not a gross on the gross harvest, not to mention the fact that first fruits had to be taken out also. So the tithing was always on the net. It was never on the gross in the, in the scriptures. They just don't use the term gross or net in the scriptures. But when you look at the, what those two words mean, it was on the gross. Now let's get into the, the tithe that the church patterns they're teaching after, which would be the, Levitic, the Levitical tithe, or the first tithe. Hello? And I will mention here, there were three tithes commanded by God. Uh, the first tithe, Leviticus 27, verses 30 to 33, defines the tithe as a tenth of crops and animals and herds and flocks, and Numbers 18 gives the ordinances or instructions for this tithe and commands the tithe be taken to the Levites. And the purpose of the tithe was to support the Levitical priesthood. The second tithe, which is Deuteronomy 14, 22 to 27, which is also known as the festival tithe, was only on crops, a tenth of crops. And then they added to that the firstborn animals, not a tenth, but the firstborn animals, and they took that to the yearly feast. And the purpose of that tithe was that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And the third tithe, Deuteronomy 14, 28 to 29, is also known as the three-year tithe, or the poor tithe, or the welfare tithe. And that was a tenth of crops that was kept within thy gates at home in the city. And they invited the Levites, orphans, widows, strangers, the poor to eat. So there were three mm -hmm. different tithes, but I hate to even say that, that there were three tithes. I prefer saying there are three places in the scriptures where God commanded a tenth of something to be used for some purpose. Because when we say there are three tithes, we're sort of relating the three tithes together and they have nothing to do with each other. It's just three different times, a mathematically a tenth was used. Now, the Levitical tithe. Let's go to Leviticus 27, verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Okay. The grain from the soil or fruit from the trees would be classified as assets. Those are not income. If and when the farmer sold or exchanged those items, the fruit, that would be income. So the farmer actually made his income by selling or exchanging those crops. He did not mm. tithe from that income. Now, we have proof that the economy at that time is very similar to what we have today. They had markets to buy and sell their crops and their animals. And that's proven in the second tithe. Deuteronomy 14, 22 to 27 says, if you have too far to go to go to that festival, the feast, it says convert your tithe into, King James Version says, money. You convert it into money. Put the money in your hand go to the place which was Jerusalem for the feast and take that money and buy back your tithe. Buy the food and drink you want. So they had to have markets to buy and sell. So they, the, yep. this whole idea that all they did was barter is incorrect. According to 
uh, my research, bartering actually ended as an everyday method of doing business before the days of Abraham. So oh, wow. they had markets. They had markets to buy and sell. Then we go to verse 32. And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. The animals are assets. If they sold or exchanged the animals, what they received would be income. So we have, it's plain to see, by definition and not interpretation, I'm not interpreting, I'm using by definition, God's command to tithe was on assets, not income. Those assets came from God's labor, not man's labor. So we know they had money, we know they had income, they, we know they had markets to buy and sell, they had assets. And then if you notice, the tithe was a tenth of the crops, not the first. In fact, it was the last one out of every ten. So the tithe was not the first. And then if we go to verse 30, uh, 33, he shall not search whether it be good or bad. The tithe was not the first, and it was not the best. It's however it came up when you got to the tenth one. So this bit about the tithe is your first tenth, that's incorrect. The tithe is the best, that's incorrect. First of all, when you go to money, there is no best. Whether it's your first dollar or your last dollar, they're the same. <laughs> one is not better than another. One is not better than another. First fruits have nothing to do with the tithe. The tithe did not come from first fruits. There's no tenth in first fruits. First fruits went to the priests, not the Levites. Um, and there was a reason for fir first fruits was considered the best of the fruit. Yeah, that's, it was considered that, that that was the best, the very first of the fruit. Well, you can't have the very best on money. This, it, it, there is no best dollar. One dollar is as good as any other dollar. So there, there is, it, and, and it doesn't matter whether it's the first dollar or the last dollar, a dollar is a dollar. Still a but dollar. it did make a difference on crops. Yes, sir. Wow, that's so, good. That's good. Uh, we, have to, we have to keep in mind that, that money, just it doesn't work. It does not work when we get to the scriptures. If we look at Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 37, uh, to prove what I've just said, and that we shall bring the first fruits of our dough and our offerings and the fruit of all manner of trees, of wine and of oil, unto the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God, and the tithes of our ground unto the Levites, that the same Levites may have the tithes in all the cities of our tillage. So we learn the first fruits were taken to the temple for the priests, and the tithes were taken to the Levites who lived in the Levitical cities. So it's impossible that the tithe and first fruits is the same thing since they went to different places. Now, people will say, well, the tithe went to the temple. That's what Malachi is talking about. All the tithe, put the tithes, all the tithes in the storehouse. Well, let's go to Nehemiah uh, chapter 10, the next verse, 38. And the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites take tithes, and the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes unto the house of our God, to the chambers, and to the treasure house. So what this is telling us is, in Numbers 18, we are told God commands the tithe that belongs to him, the holy tithe, he gave to the Levites. It was to be taken to the Levites. The Levites took the whole tithe. Then the Levites were commanded to take a tenth of that tithe to the priest. That's the tenth that's talking about. That's the tenth that went to the temple storehouse. Not the tithe from the farmers, but the tithe from the Levites. So the only tithe that went to the storehouse was the tithe that came from those that received the original tithe. So if you don't receive a tithe from somebody, you have no tenth to take to the storehouse. You have to receive that tenth from somebody else. So uh, this whole 
the whole thing is, is a puzzle that has to be put together because there are so many sections, so many yeah. verses in the Bible that you have to put together. And that's not what happens in the church. They take a verse from here and a verse from there, and they combine them. They try to take uh, a verse from the second tithe, the purpose of the tithe that you may learn to fear the Lord, and they use that with the first tithe, the Levitical tithe, and say that's the purpose of the tithe. Well, that wasn't the purpose of the priesthood tithe. The priesthood tithe was something totally different. Now, Gary, let me interrupt you just for a second, because you touched on something about the Levitical priesthood, because we know within the church system, one of the tithes that is usually, or one of the arguments for tithing that is often used is Malachi. You know, Malachi right. 3 is the one that most people have been beaten over the head, manipulated, and guilted into giving the will a man rob God arguments. Can you yes. can you help us un explain that one there so to give people a better understanding contextually yes. what scripture is talking about there? And also okay. while you're doing uh, and, uh, talk about how Nehemiah fits into that context. Okay. Okay. First of all, the pastors normally start with Malachi verse 3 8, but even if they start with 3 7, uh, they don't explain it. And verse 3 7, just before it gets into the robbing God, says, Even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from my ordinances and not and have not kept them. Return unto me and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you say, Wherein shall we return? Okay, let's start again. Even from the days of your fathers ye are gone away from mine ordinances. He's talking about his ordinances. I have asked so many people. Where in the scriptures does it, are you, what are you following when you tithe? What scripture are you following? They'll say, oh, Malachi. I said, Malachi is not the ordinance for tithing. Malachi tells us they weren't following the tithing ordinances or commands as God had given them. They were doing something other than what God had commanded, and that's where they had gone wrong. And it says... You have gone away from my ordinances. And if you go to Colossians ver, uh, chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So we're told right here those ordinances were nailed to the cross. So we know right now Malachi has nothing to do with today. It has to do with the mm. Old Testament law. Now, where did the robbing God come in? First of all, God says you rob me of tithes and offerings. Now, in order to rob guy, a God of tithes, there had to be something, some command to tithe. In order to rob God of offerings, there has to be some command for offerings. So if you can't find those commands... Then you don't know what they were doing wrong. Well, Malachi chapter 1 tells us how they robbed him of the offerings. Under Numbers 18, as I explained, the tithe was given to the Levites. The Levites were to give a tenth to the priest. The Levites were to give the best tenth out of the tithe they received to the priest. Then the priest was to use the best out of that tenth mm -hmm. as a heave offering. Malachi 1 tells us they were using the worst. They were using the blind animals. They were using the, the animals that were not whole. They were, they were using the worst and keeping the best for themselves. That was robbing God of the offering. Then when we get to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 10, and I'm just going to summarize here, the priests rob God of the tithe by the tithe not being allowed to get to the Levites, their portion. 
what happens is, here's, here's what I have to explain in order to get to that part. Uh, okay. People seem to think, uh, because, well, this is what they're told, that the, uh, the Levites and the priests, they worked full-time at the temple. Well, the fact is, they rotated. There were so many Levites and so many priests that they actually only worked at the temple approximately two weeks a year, one week out of every 24 weeks uh, on a rotation basis. And for the, uh, the priest, you look in Chronicles chapter 24 and 25, and you look in uh, 26, chapter 26 for the Levites, and that will show where they were divided into what was called 24 courses, which is almost like saying 24 families or 24 groups. So they rotated. When they went to the temple, they would take the food they needed, and it would go into the storehouse for that week, and then they would take it out as they needed to eat. So that there would be food in the storehouse for them to eat during their week of serving at the temple. Well, when the Levites, <laughs> all of a sudden, their food wasn't there for them. It had been taken. So the, in actuality, the priests stole the tithe from the Levites since God had given the tithe to the Levites, you couldn't really rob God of the tithe. You rob God of the tithe by stealing it from the Levites or taking it from the Levites. The Levites did not get the tithe that they should have had when they were serving at the temple. The temple actually had to close down. They had to close their doors because the Levites left to go back to their fields. People don't understand. The Levites had land just like the rest of them. They didn't own the land. They didn't own the land, but they were re the those that inherited the promised land were required to give a portion of that land to the Levites to live on rent free for their homes and for their livestock and so forth. They had their own farms to go back to to work on during the rest of the year. So they they actually. <laughs> They, they, were, they actually had their own jobs, and they only worked at the temple two weeks per year, not all year long. The tithe was their inheritance. There were, you start out with 12 tribes of Israel, and we won't get into splitting the tribe and all that. To make it simple, <laughs> there were 12 tribes of Israel. 11 tribes inherited the promised land. The 12th tribe inherited the tithe. The tithe was paid by the 11 tribes that inherited the promised land. They paid it to the one tribe that did not inherit the promised land. The only people in the Old Testament that were commanded to tithe were those that inherited the promised land with everything on it. They got the land, they got the houses on it, the animals, the crops, whatever was there, all free and clear, no mortgage payment to make, no rent to pay, and they were commanded to tithe on the crops and animals and take it to the Levites who inherited the tithe instead of the promised land. No one else tithed. Wage earners did not tithe. There's no example oh, wow. in the scriptures to show that Jesus ever tithed as a carpenter. There's no example to show that Paul ever tithed as a tent maker. Peter did not tithe as a fisherman. God specified what his tithe was to come from. And it was from crops and animals and herds and flocks, nothing else. Money would not have been accepted as a tithe. You could, you didn't, it, it can't be that money was a tithe when in Leviticus, verse, uh, let me get it here, should be verse 31, I believe. Uh, Let's get stuff. get back to that I'm turning pages here and uh, okay verse 30 31 and if a man mm -hmm. will at all redeem aught of his tithes he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof well redeem means basically to buy you want to buy mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. uh, if it was money you wouldn't buy money and add a fifth part to it mm-hmm the, the whole idea here was, if 
you either wanted those crops, because you could only redeem the crops, not the animals, if you wanted those crops for your own family, or if you didn't want the problem of having to transport those to the Levites, you had the option to buy them at a 20% penalty over what they were worth. The fact that they had a worth in silver shows that they had a monetary system. So they had to add 20%. It wouldn't make sense to add 20% if a tithe could be money. Uh, the tithe, in every example of the tithe commanded by God, of the three different tenths commanded by God, in every single example in the scriptures, the tithe was eaten. It was food. It was nothing mm -hmm. else. It was food. It was a way to distribute food to the... Uh, Levites and to the priests uh, who could not own any land. Uh, there was, there's nothing else involved. To explain the tithe in a different way, the, sure. the priesthood tithe, God gave the Israelites, the 11 tribes, the promised land as their inheritance. But he reserved, he reserved a tenth of the future crops to be grown and he reserved one-tenth of the future animals to be born in herds and flocks. He reserved them for himself. Title really never passed on that tenth to the Israelite farmers. The farmers, when you really look at the scriptures, when you look at Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 and 32, God already owned the tenth. The Israelites merely transported the tithe to where God told them to take it to, take it to the Levites. It wasn't that they were giving back to God a tenth of what God gave to them. God never gave them that tenth to begin with. God kept that tenth for himself, but it was on their land. He gave them the land, and that's why it uses the word redeem, because they were like buying it back because it was in their possession, but they really didn't have ownership to it. If they had ownership to it, they wouldn't have to redeem it. Uh, but they did not have ownership. God had ownership. He gave that ownership to the Levites, so the Levites then would be paid a 20% in addition to the value if they wanted to redeem those crops. The tithe was not giving back to God something that God had given to them. The, the priesthood tithe was not giving to God to show appreciation to God. It was in all reality of what we would call a tax today. Even though that's not totally correct because they didn't own it in the first place. But it would be most similar to a tax where uh, they owed it. They owed it back, and that's re the reason why the word pay can be used, because there's an obligation. There's an obligation to take that tithe to the Levites, and because there's an obligation, you can use the word pay. They did not give the tithe to the Levites as in gift. Uh, they did not pay it as in a bill, but they did pay it in that it was an obligation to either take it to the Levites or buy it. From the Levites. There's now, Gary, here's this. one thing, though. I'm sorry. Let me, let me interrupt you here because we're getting yes. low on time. But I want to transition because we want to give you an opportunity to highlight your book and your, your website. But one of the things that we wanted to address is tithing versus new covenant giving. Could you, can you give us an idea of the responsibility of a believer in regards to giving now underneath the new covenant? Okay. It's very important for people to understand that those of us that teach against tithing are all forgiving. We, we, some of us give a lot more than the tithers give, or that the tithers put out of their pocket, because I don't like to use the word give with tithe. Uh, the New Testament teaches very uh, uh, many giving principles that are superior to a so-called tithing principle. A tithing principle lumps everybody together and says everybody gives a tenth. 
Well, there is no such thing, really, as a tithing principle in the New Testament. The New Testament, probably my favorite principle on giving in, in the New Testament is the principle of equality, which is, which is in my book. The principle of equality, to make it, break it down simple, means if you have an abundance, you have an excess, but your brother, your neighbor, we'll call him your brother, has a lack, mm. that you will take some of your surplus or your excess and you will give it to your brother so that he does not lack. That's the main principle that I see in the New Testament. It's not to say that everybody is to be equal. So that if, uh, if, you, if you're making a million dollars a year and you only need uh, 50000 to live on, that you're supposed to give the rest away. It doesn't mean that. It means that somebody has an excess and somebody is lacking, the one with the excess should be helping the one that's lacking. It's a very mm. simple thing. It's what was brought out in your first hour as I was trying to wake up uh, listening to it <laughs> on Jesus said, the least you do for these, you're doing for me. What he was saying is, as you help the, the needy or the poor, you're actually giving it to me. You won't find one scripture in the Bible, no scripture in the New Testament, that says when you give to the corporation organized to do business as a church, when you give to the church organization, you are giving to me. That's not in the Bible anywhere. But there is in the Bible a way to justify giving to the organized church, and that is another principle given, is you give where there's a need. If you attend church services, you have an obligation to pay your fair share if you're able to. If there are those there that are not able to pay their fair share of the bills, then you should, and you're able to pay more than your fair share, then you should pay a little bit more than your fair share. However, if all you're doing is giving to the church and nowhere else, you really aren't even giving at all. You're, you're paying for a service that you are, you are receiving. You know, we use this thing that you give to the church. Well, the definition under Webster's Dictionary of give is to present voluntarily and without expecting compensation uh, something given voluntary without payment in return, you're not supposed to get anything back when you give. Well, uh, the American Heritage Dictionary says to make a present of uh, given voluntarily without compensation. If you are getting benefit from that church building by the air conditioning or the heating or a place to sit or the benefit of the PA system, or the benefit of a pastor giving you a sermon, or the benefit of the music, or the benefit of whatever else, you're getting something out of that. That's like paying your dues. That's not mm. a true gift. And most churchgoers consider it a gift, and that's the limit of their giving. They give nothing above that. And in fact, then they're really giving nothing unless they're giving far above their fair share. Then they may be giving to help somebody else uh, pay their fair share. Otherwise, giving at church is not a true gift. It's giving in the sense that you're handing it over to them, but it's not giving in the sense of a true gift. Giving to the poor, getting no benefit back other than your satisfaction of knowing you've helped somebody, that's what giving is all about. Giving is not giving to an organization. It, it's unfortunate that in the church today, and when I use the word church, I'm talking about the organized church, the corporation that is doing business as a church. That, that's exactly what it is. They're doing business as a church. Mm. That is a business transaction. It's a voluntary transaction, although many people, People are put in, uh, in that guilt uh, from the pastor that they're not giving or not tithing or whatever, uh, a complete guilt feeling that many people have. It's still, it's not uh, a 
legal obligation to give when you go to church. But it, there is a moral obligation. If you're going to use the services, then you should pay for those services. Myself, I've given up going to the organized church. I don't use their services. So 100% of my giving goes to those in need. Uh, and it's far more than 10%. Uh, so these people that say if you don't believe in tithing, you're stingy. If you don't tithe, you're stingy. That's yeah. not the case at all. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with what is correct and what is not correct. Um, That's very so good. Giving, yeah. Yes, we need to give. No. We, if, if, you have a, if you have a Christian heart and you're able to give financially, you find yourself giving. But there are mm -hmm. other ways. If you don't have the finances, there are other ways to give. It doesn't have to be monetary. God wants us to give ourselves, not our money. Mm -hmm. He wants right. ourselves. Mm -hmm. He wants us, not our money. A hundred percent, not ten. What? Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> people that say Jesus was was is the tithe. I, I hear people against tithing say, well, Jesus was our tithe. Well, Jesus... God didn't give us 10% of Jesus. <laughs> Jesus didn't die 10% 10, 10 on, the, on the cross. Uh, it, it, was a hundred, it was an all or nothing thing. So I have a hard time with this, with this thinking that Jesus is our tithe. I'll say that at the cross, now there is no more tithe. Jesus did away with the tithe. But Jesus didn't mm -hmm. become a tenth of anything. Right, right, right. <laughs> Here about time, man. and uh, we want to talk about the website and the book that you have out. So, if you don't mind, you know, tell us uh, if they people want to reach you, um, how to get to your website, what your book's about, real quick. Okay, the website would be at www dot tithing one zero one dot com. Tithing one zero one dot com. Uh, that's uh, the one that's on, on, on your website now that shows, so that's the one I, I will use, and our class is called Tithing 101. So that's, that should be very easy to remember. The book can be downloaded from the website uh, right on the front page. There's a couple places you can click on to go to the book page, and it's a free download. I am one that refuses to take donations. I am giving back to God doing my ministry for God uh, as a way to just uh, show my appreciation to him, and I want zero compensation for it. Uh, this would be a little early for me to mention, but I'm going to say it. I am in the process of working with a publisher that will be, hopefully this will, this will be finalized in a few days, that is planning on publishing my book and distributing it worldwide as a free book. Uh, oh, wow. So that no one is charged for the book, and they can have it in print form eventually. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, it's a PDF file that can easily be printed off if you have a computer and a printer. Uh, so that's that is in the works. Uh, All right. My email address is on the website, just preacher at tithingtoday dot com. But you can get that off the, the website. <clears throat> and if there are any other questions, I'm here to answer. All right. Uh, I, we appreciate you coming on with us today, man. I uh, appreciate you taking the time out to uh, to talk about this topic uh, because it is a, a, a huge topic that uh, people really don't understand. Uh, we, we think we understand it, uh, and it's basically because that's what we've been taught. But, you know, as you broke a lot of it down, um, I think it, it was very needed, and I think we still need to continue teaching this thing until – Everybody and, wakes up. Right, right. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that my teaching will show those, even if, even if you're in a denomination that says uh, uh, that you're supposed to tithe today, if you understand what the tithe really is in the Bible, you see that you don't tithe on your income anyway. You know, you won't be tithing. You won't have anything to tithe from, even if you know you're, you're under the tithing. If you think you're under the tithing command, you still can't do it. Mm -hmm. Right. It's impossible. It's impossible to tithe biblically. And I think right. really what gets people, I, I'm running out of time, I have to say this, people really confuse 
because how we you talked about it when you first came on the definition of tithe. They just assume tithing is means strictly ten percent of your income. And right. They say tithe. Well, if I got a hundred dollars on my check, I got to give ten dollars, and that's just where they stop. But the substance of the tithe, I think, is what's important. So right, right. For God, if you. So. I'll be very quick here. If you if you go by the original definition of tithe, if you take a bag of peanuts to church with you and you take out one tenth of those peanuts and put it in the offering plate, you have tithe by the definition of tithe. You have not tithe biblically, but you've tithe just as biblically as if you put a tenth of your income in that plate. Wow. It's a, yeah. it's just a tenth, period. Yep. <laughs> but not biblically, but you haven't tithed biblically. Right. Wow. Not with the wow. peanuts or with your income. <laughs> That's right. Well, it's Gary, we truly appreciate you coming on, man. I know we just there's so much more information to cover. I pray that everybody will check out Gary's website, download his book, man. Share the link and the book with other people to kind of plant seeds and water some seeds, and hopefully. We can get some folk to stop tithing and do some other things with their finances, like helping those who are actually in need. John, you got anything else, bro? Now he on mute because he was creating the echo. He All was right. creating the echo. Yeah. Well, that was impressed out, brother. Okay. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the the ability to have this discussion, to talk about this sacred cow to share information with people lord and we pray truly that people will get to a place where they can study for themselves to understand that this is not a uh tithing is not something that you need to do that we are called to give we are called to love we are called to serve lord we just pray for gary we thank you for him we thank you for using him in the manner with his ministry that you are we just pray lord that people will come to understand what we're trying to do here is for people to understand who you are and their identity in you we love you and we appreciate you and god bless everyone for listening we pray all these things in your son jesus name amen Amen. 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 Again, everybody, it's tithing101.com is the website. You can go to his website. You can get his email address if you got questions. It's preacher at tithingtoday.com. It's his email. And download his book. And like Elgin said, share it, man. Just share it with people. Because um, a lot of things we haven't really thought about. But, you know, it's good. All right. It's all good. Gary, we appreciate you, man. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity. This is just uh, God opening another door for me. Amen. Amen. Okay, folks, man. Uh, we haven't fully decided on a topic for next week, have we? Have we got a topic for next week? We had done? a couple of topics we were talking back. first one is called The Silence of the Lambs. Um, uh, we're going to be coming from two aspects with that. First one being uh, how people say you shouldn't call out false teachers and false prophets. And the other aspect is on how people see things going on in church but won't speak up and mm -hmm. out against what they see. So the silence of the lambs is one topic we're considering. The other one is uh, the lack of gospel in gospel music. So one of those two topics we'll hit next Sunday. Tune in to us next Sunday, man. You can catch us every Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Check us out on YouTube or Facebook page. Also, check out the anchor of CFR shows, the, the actual CFR show that you can catch every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. They come on what time? 12? Yes, noon Eastern Standard. 12 yeah. noon Eastern Standard Time. And I think we are going to end the show here. Yes, in my television anchor voice. All right, man. <laughs> Till next time. We catch you all, folks, next week. Same time, same place. I'll let you. Thank you for checking out this episode of Real Talk Radio. Be sure to check out our YouTube channel and Facebook page. Or drop us a line at 4realtalkradio at gmail.com. That's the number 4, realtalkradio at gmail.com. Man, send your comments, concerns.
concerns, criticisms, or show ideas. We would love to hear from you. Till next week, we out.